Hello and welcome to UFC Inside the Octagon. John Gooden alongside Dan Hardy, great to have your company. UFC 222 goes down on March 3rd from the T-Mobile in Las Vegas. On today's show, we're going to preview the co-main event matchup between top contenders Frankie Edgar and Brian Ortega. But first, before we get to that, we're going to be taking a look at the main event for the women's featherweight title. The champion, Chris Cyborg, puts her belt on the line against former Invicta FC bantamweight champion, Yana Kunitskaya. The Russian challenger has the opportunity to make a name for herself against arguably the greatest female fighter of all time. The champ has been unstoppable in the octagon and now takes aim at a third straight title defense. This one for the gold. Dan, let's pull up the facts and the stats. The champion, the challenger, Chris Cyborg, been a feature of this show many, many times yeah. now. Um, what are we looking at here? I guess a lot of experience first and foremost. Yeah, a lot of experience and a four inch reach advantage for Cyborg, which is good because um, she's fighting a, a, a really talented kicker. I mean, if we look down here, uh, 2007 Russian Taekwondo champion and 2011 Muay Thai champion. So. She's got a heavy kicking game. She's got a, an ability to use her range of her legs, much like Holly Holm did, but the difference being here, she's an orthodox fighter and a little bit more uh, suitable to the, to the styling of, of Chris Cyborg. I think this will be a much more aggressive matchup for both of these ladies than the, the kind of cautious uh, performance that we got in her last title defense. But I think it's interesting, especially because, you know, Kunitz guy is coming over as the Invicta champion. She's stepping up. She knows who Cyborg is. Every female pl uh, fighter on the planet knows who Cyborg is, and he's kind of aiming to get to where she is at some point. This is a huge opportunity for her here. Yeah. And not only to step in and fight Chris Cyborg, but to be a UFC fighter for the first time in her career. OK, well, on that note, then, I think we need to do maybe a little bit of an introduction yeah. to Jana Kunitskaya, former Invicta FC champion, as you said, a yeah. place where Chris Cyborg has been before. But what more can you tell us? Well, Invicta is a great proving ground for all these female fighters. And a lot of the, the, the fights in the female divisions in the UFC have crossed over from Invicta. Now, what we've seen of, of Kunitskaya in the UFC, in, the, in Invicta so far, is that uh, striking style, that elusive Taekwondo styling, but with, with much more of a Muay Thai twist to it. Now, it's interesting because this is the, this is the path that I came through uh, to, march, to mixed martial arts. I started with Taekwondo, moved into, into uh, Muay Thai, and then uh, mixed martial arts. And I think that, you know, with Taekwondo, you get good explosive power, you get good footwork and good speed, and you understand that it's a bit more of a game of tag. You know how to get out of the way in, in order to, you know, in order to counter your fighter instead of standing your ground and trading, much like Chris Cyborg does. So I expect her to be more elusive. The other thing we've got to consider as well is that she's trained alongside Holly Holm, who's just spent 25 minutes with Cyborg. So that's a, a you know, a real, real uh, source of knowledge for her, as, as well as the fact that she's trained at the Jackson Wink camp and they know how to prepare champions for championship fights. I think she has a lot of different skills to Holly. As we were saying before, Holly's, you know, she's a southpaw. She's got a very side-on stance, which makes that lead right leg a real problem for a fighter like Cyborg, who is very aggressive. Um, and a lot of the strikes that Cyborg uses are more suited to an orthodox fighter. So with Kunitskaya, she's got, uh, she's got a, a more ideal opponent for her to show her strengths. But obviously with Kunitskaya, she has a lot of untangibles, those spinning kicks, those, uh, you know, those explosive one-shot power kicks that we've seen her use in Invicta and before in her career. So what I'm expecting to see from Chris Cyborg is for her to be a bit more cautious because she's not going to know as much about uh, Kunitskaya as she did about Holly Holm. OK, well, let's turn our focus to the champ then. And the last time we were here and inside the Octagon looking at her, it was before she fought Holly Holm. Mm. We've seen that fight now. For me, she showed a couple of different aspects to her game really impressive in that fight but put a few more layers to that if you could yeah well when you think cyborg you think that berserker aggression you think that shoot box mentality which is you know the vandalay silvers of the world with where, where they just march you down and it's like a buzzsaw attack they, it's a very aggressive style but as i was saying with holly home being very good as a southpaw with that lead leg it made it difficult for Chris Cyborg to, to close distance aggressively. So what we actually saw in this fight was her fight in a different way to, to normal. She, she took her time, she cut the octagon down, but what she was doing was she was forcing Holly home to throw first because Holly was feeling that the, you know, the space was being taken away from her. She was feeling under pressure, so she knew she had to do something to discourage that march forward from Cyborg. And then as the fight progressed, now we're into the fourth round here, this is another cyborg that we've not really seen a great deal of either. We saw a little bit against Tanya Evinger, but much more picking her shots, jab, low kick, jab, low kick, instead of just looking for that big power right hand all the time. 
And as I was saying against a fighter like Kunitskaya, who's got those untangibles, those spinning kicks like a, an Edson Barbosa, she's kind of got to treat this like Khabib did in that fight, where right. she can march him down, march her down, but not uh, take risks, not expose herself to any shots that she may not have seen coming. So a, a cautious early beginning, I think, is wise and then she can start to wear her down later on. Now, the, the nice thing about the fighting style that she's got now is that she has two, she has two options. Jason Perillo has given her that more uh, calm, uh, point-based approach where she can pick her shots and she doesn't have to throw power with everything. But we always know that she's got this in her back pocket. If she needs it, she can pull out that shoot box mentality and she can throw all kinds of fire at her opponents. And, you know, this is the cyborg that we used to see in that real kind of buzzsaw, um, that, that buzzsaw attack that we see where she just throws wild punches and knees and can be very overwhelming and overpowering for her opponents. But as I was saying with the Holly Home fight, we saw her hold that back a little bit. And that was really nice because now she has options. Now she feels like, you know, if she needs to be cautious, she's not going to expose herself. And you've got to think now the, now the talent's getting better. She's a UFC champion now. So she's going to be fighting the best contenders in the world now. So it makes sense for her to, to hold it back a little bit and to read these opponents a bit more, especially if she wants to hold the belt for a long time. Because... You know, with these unknown commodities coming through, like Kunitskaya, with these, you know, these great spinning kicks and stuff, there is always that danger of getting caught. And as Tonya Evans, you found out when, when they first faced off for, for the Invicta title, caught her in a beautiful armbar. Now, obviously, that was a no contest in the end, but the surprise factor was still there. She stepped into Invicta as a new contender. She's doing the same thing here with the UFC. It was nice to see Cyborg become almost the counterfighter, which mm. was what Holly Holm was more recognised for. But do you think that... Kunitskaya brings that more traditional square-hipped approach that really Cyborg fed off of in her early days, which doesn't necessarily look great for Kunitskaya, but what's your take on that? <laughs> no, I agree, I agree. This is going to be a much more of a comfortable opponent for her to fight. A lot of the things that Cyborg does that, that we were talking about in the breakdown before the home fight, she relies very much on that slip into the outside of the right hand and powering her right hook through, which wasn't really able, uh, wasn't really able to do against Holly Holm. She kept getting caught with the right hook of her own. So... She, she will have to tweak less about her style going into this fight. Right. But another thing with the Holly Holm fight, and if you look at the stats, they, they both threw, over 25 minutes, they both threw just over a 220 punches. The difference was Holly Holm landed less than 20% and Cyborg landed more than 50%. Wow. So that shows um, a, an evolution in her approach, an evolution in that aggression that she can now hold back just a little bit and she knows she doesn't have to spend all that in the first round yeah. and try and overwhelm people. She's, she's got options now, which is great for a champion. Exactly that. She has a champion's mindset. She's looking to keep that belt and make history. Always exciting when Chris Cyborg is inside the octagon. And of course, she's looking to solidify her standing as a champion and become the greatest female fighter of all time. OK, well, let's turn our attentions now to the co-main event. Frankie Edgar was all set to challenge the reigning king, Max Holloway, for the featherweight crown. However, Holloway's injured. Frankie still wanted to do the dance with someone, so up steps Brian Ortega to seize the opportunity of a lifetime. A Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt with a sharp submission game, Ortega's unbeaten run in the UFC has seen him emerge as a legitimate threat to the division's elite. T-City now faces his toughest challenge to date against Frankie, the answer Edgar. One of the most decorated fighters in UFC history, Edgar's date with destiny lies in wait, but first, he must once again confirm his status as the number one contender with a win at UFC 222. The co-main is a top of the tree featherweight matchup. Dan, I'm a bit biased. I love the featherweight division. <laughs> but also, we have a new guy to be looking yes. at in Brian Ortega. Oh, yes. And what a prospect he is. Well, a contender now. But Frankie Edgar... Who doesn't love a Frankie fight? <laughs> this one has all the makings. Yeah, he's been, you know, he's been a part of the furniture in the UFC for some time now. Whereas Brian Ortega, you know, respect to Frankie for staying on the card because the fans always want to see him fight. Yeah. Brian Ortega for me is one of the most exciting prospects in the sport because it's not only the, the way he fights, it's the, the broad spectrum that he can draw from in technique. He's got good boxing, he's got an excellent ground game, and he's a new problem for Frankie Edgar, which is really interesting. Just like Yair Rodriguez was, but Frankie was the answer to that prospect. So, Problems and you know. answers. <laughs> I see what you did there. Well, look, let's get into the facts and the stats then. We've seen Frankie many times. A couple of things that I'm just going to highlight and I'll yeah. hand it over just, to just you. Just a decade in, in difference for, for well, age. Well, it is significant, isn't it? It is, absolutely. And, you know, and all of that supports, I mean, look at the record in comparison. So much experience for Frankie Edgar. But when we go down these stats, 
Second most significant strikes landed in UFC history. I think he's behind Bisping, which is very impressive for a you know, former middleweight champion to be ahead of Frankie. Right. Uh, fourth most takedowns in UFC history. Again, he knows he can take down anybody he faces because he's done it. And this one, the most fight time in UFC history. So over six hours, he spent a quarter of a day in the <laughs> octagon. So, I mean, there's a lot of comfortability that you can draw from that. He's been in there so many times. He's got a great output. He's got great takedowns. And he's, you know, the, the, the octagon's been his living room for uh, many, many years. Yeah. Whereas Brian Ortega, although he's still an emerging star, th there's a lot of experience that he's coming up against here. And you've got to think that, you know, his unbeaten record is going to kind of carry some of that momentum with him. Yeah. Although he's had a lot of time in there, he's also had a lot of performance bonuses as well. That's true. I'm just going to highlight this because I know this is going to lead in really <laughs> nicely uh, to your analysis, Dan. So just people watching at home, tied fourth most third round finishes in UFC history. Keep that in mind. Mm. And Dan, let's yes. have a look. At Frankie Edgar, he's been on the show a lot of yeah. a lot of times. He has, he has. He has a certain style, but it, it keeps on working. Mm -hmm. Well, his fundamentals are sound. That's really that's really ultimately what's kept Frankie in the game for so long. He's got excellent boxing and he's got great takedowns. And ultimately, it's the seamlessness of these transitions which really keeps him ahead of the curve. Like you can see here, particularly against Oliveira, he was pushing forward. He's a lot of the time he's fighting taller guys as well, so he's looping over the top. But he's got great boxing fundamentals, beautiful footwork as well, circling off and creating nice angles for himself. Typical Mark Henry kind of fighter. Beautiful power in his punches, but it's all down to technique. He's not a power puncher necessarily. He has to make these opportunities available to himself by using his intelligence and his experience. And then once he's got you thinking about defending your head, once you're thinking about his boxing combinations, then he starts to time you. And when you start to overcommit to those punches, like you have seen against uh, Jeremy Stevens and Cub Swanson, obviously, that's a perfect example because it was a big uppercut he loaded, which we do see Brian Ortega do. His ability to level change underneath and elevate people, lift them and slam them, is, I mean, really, really second to none. You know, there are wrestlers that come into mixed martial arts as good wrestlers, then there are wrestlers that are good for mixed martial arts. And you've got to think, Yoel Romero was a great wrestler coming into mixed martial arts. Frankie Edgar's a good wrestler for mixed martial arts, right. just like George St. Pierre, just like Khabib Namagomedov. And there's a reason for that, which I'm going to touch on in the, next, uh, in the next Frankie Edgar playlist. But if we just move on to Brian Ortega immediately, the first thing I want to talk about is his takedown defense. He's got a real confidence and a real swagger to him. And a part of that is down to the fact that if you take him down, you're in his world. So if he does get taken down, he's, his main focus is going down to the ground on his terms. If he does decide he wants to stay on the feet, though, he's got good balance, he's got good fundamentals, great hand fighting. And another thing that I really like as well, and we can see it here against Thiago Tavares, as Tavares is fighting for this position, he's got good balance, he's defending, but as soon as he finds an opportunity, he turns and pushes away. He's very conscious of, of, of breaking that, uh, that distance without uh, exposing himself to shots. And then once he's found his comfort in those first round or two, that's when we see him turn on, turn on his power punching. And he's got a real confident Diaz style of punching. Real big looping punches, knowing that every one of them could knock you out if it catches you right. And beautiful stance switching as well, moving in. Look at that, beautiful switch stance to, to southpaw for the right hook and then back again. And then similar with Frankie Edgar, he gets you thinking about the punches, but then he starts bringing up knees. Two things Frankie's got to be thinking about, because if he's penetrating for a takedown from the front, the uppercut and the knee are both a huge threat to him, as well as his front headlock, which is probably one of the best in the sport at the moment. So it's a new challenge for Frankie. There are, there are things that Brian Ortega does well that a lot of people that Frankie's fought have not really got a game in. So when you, when you think about Brian Ortega, you've got to think that he's, he's not necessarily a fast starter, but he's not... Uh, a slow starter by, by any means. He's a cautious starter. He takes his time. Henna Gracie in his corner has got a typical Gracie game plan. Take them into deeper waters. You know, make uh, fatigue a factor. Is that a factor with Frankie Edgar? I don't think it is. So he might have to start a little bit faster in this fight, but we know that he gets better as the fight goes on. So Frankie's probably going to win the earlier rounds. He's going to push that pace quickly. But then Brian Ortega, that third round, as Clay Guida found out, is a huge danger. And that's really where Frankie's got to be on his game. Could be a bit of a risk, though, because Frankie is going to come out the gate, as he always does, fast and hard. And then when he's chaining those things, he won't let you off. No. If the first single leg doesn't succeed, he'll go to a double, go back to a single, and it's the fourth attempt that he'll get you. And then he's... He's exactly. clocked up some really good points. True that. And that is the difference between being a good wrestler coming into mixed martial arts and being a good wrestler for mixed martial arts. It's that ability to chain things together. When Frankie shoots for a takedown, 
it's almost like he assumes that the first one's going to fail and he knows what his second, third, fourth options are. Brilliant, and it's that that wears his opponents down because they feel like, I've defended one takedown. He's still on me. Hang on a minute. Now I'm struggling. I'm now trying to keep my balance. I'm fighting for a wizard. Hang on a minute. I can break his grip. Now you lose the wizard. Now he's on your back and he's slamming you around. And another thing that's beneficial to Frankie Edgar going into this fight with Brian Ortega is that his whole game is about circling to the back. He's Everything that he does is about taking the person's back and controlling them from behind. Now, when you've got a guy that's got great front headlock attacks and a great guard, the safest place to be is behind him. Great point. And this is my favorite takedown in all of mixed martial arts, purely because the way he chains it together with that short uppercut to make the takedown available. Even Cubs smiles afterwards. <laughs> he, he knew it was a good takedown. And then the other thing that we see with Frankie Edgar, when he grounds his opponent, that relentless pace that he sets with the ground and pound. Again, circling around behind, staying away from the danger zones that, uh, that Ortega poses. And if he does find himself in the guard, the only place that's really safe against Brian Ortega is if you smash him up against the fence. You use the fence and the floor as an anvil, and then you hammer your opponent against it. It's the Khabib style, and Frankie Edgar does it very well. The reason that he has to do it up against the fence, though, is because Brian Ortega's very slick off his back. And as we saw in his Thiago Tavares fight, I'm just going to jump straight into it. There was a position here where Thiago Tavares was in a very similar position to a lot of Frankie Edgar's fights. Here, look. So he's tripod up. He's stacking his opponent. So now he's got some weight on his knee, of course, but he's driving into his opponent, which is forcing Brian Ortega to hold his weight up by his shoulders. He's effectively pinning himself to the mat something Frankie Edgar's very good at doing. And with this position here, it gives the person on the bottom two choices. See, now he's standing up, now he's tripoded up. There are two options here if you're on the bottom. We've spoken about this before. You either close your guard, in which case you're holding the opponent down onto you and then he can strike, or he's standing over you and you open your guard and you use your knees as a shield, in which case he's still driving down and you're pinning yourself to the mat. Now, when I watched this, as soon as I saw it, I thought this is the danger for Frankie Edgar because we see Thiago Tavares throw a right hand here and very, very slick. Look at that. Look how that's trapped on his chest. Brian Ortega has just clamped that down. So now Thiago Tavares, being a good black belt, has recognized that danger there. So he's going to start thinking about releasing that arm and pulling it out. Brian Ortega's figured this out already. It's almost like, like a plan that he's had before he goes in, something that he's trained because he hits him with a back fist with the same arm and what always happens when you hit somebody in the face, they drop down into the guard because they're trying to get away from those big punches. Bang, hits him. You see Thiago Tavares lean in. He's yeah. trying to close that distance because he doesn't want to take any more shots. He drives his arm further into the danger zone and then Brian Ortega's hips kick out to the side and immediately isolate that arm. That's so quick. It's amazing. And you've got to think, if you're Frankie Edgar, you like that tripod position where you can ground and pound. Another thing Frankie does a lot is the can opener position. What's the perfect attack for a can opener is an arm bar. So Brian Ortega's got excellent hips off the bottom. And if Frankie's in that position, he has to be up against the fence. Otherwise, he's going to find himself trying to defend these positions. I mean, the speed in which he's able to get his hips out is really quite incredible. And just like Frankie's good at chaining things together when it comes to wrestling, Brian Ortega's excellent at chaining his jiu-jitsu together. Yeah. We'll actually see that in the next clip against, uh, against Diego Brandao because he catches the front headlock position, doesn't let him off it, locks it up nice and tight, and then as they circle to the floor, he actually uses it to take a mount position. Watch this, circles over, bumps his hips up, and transitions to the mount. Look at that, beautiful. So now he can release the head. As they roll over, he's already set him up for the triangle. And Diego Bra uh, and uh, Brandown knows what's coming, so he tries to stand out of it, and he again isolates the arm. It's beautiful work. It's that, chain, yeah, it's that chain submission attack that we've seen so many times. And the one thing that, about Brian Ortega's game that really stands out for me is the squeeze. Eddie Bravo always talks about cultivating a squeeze because if you get somebody in a choke and you go 100% all the time, you're going to burn out and you're going to lose that, that power in your arms. Brian Ortega's got that nice, slow, crushing, crushing uh, vice-like squeeze. And you can, even, you can see the panic on Cub Swanson's face there. He knows his oxygen's going. They get out into the second round and same thing happens again. This is a nice cheeky little knee to the midsection as well that, that, that opens up this opportunity. So they're grappling against the fence. This is second round now. Brian Ortega circles around. He reaches over to the back of the head, almost like to try and peel him off and then realizes that Cub's not in the position for that. So he hits him with a short knee to the midsection, bang, just enough to drop Cub's head so he can wrap it. And as I was talking about the squeeze before, watch this. So he gets locked onto Cub. Cub's now fighting out of it. Cub postures up to try and alleviate some of the pressure, and Brian Ortega realizes it's the perfect opportunity to let go of the grip, so now he's only holding on with his left hand, and readjust. 
to get the finish. Now that is a special level squeeze. That is a black belt level squeeze. And once you get clamped onto somebody like that, it's so difficult to get any space in there. We saw it against Hanato Moikanu, who's doing all the right things to escape, the hand fighting, the pressure forward, just that kick out to the side and a little squeeze. It's a black belt level squeeze. That's the only way of saying it. Eddie Bravo always used to talk about it. I remember Cultivate watching that squeeze. live. Right. And I was out of my seat. As someone who likes jujitsu, that for me was simply outstanding. To yeah. adjust your position while you're in the air, just holding on with your legs. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, a couple of talking points and questions for you then. Okay. Frankie's got quite a bit on the line here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you said it at the beginning, fair play to him for, for stepping up because he doesn't get the win here, is he going to be looking at a title shot at all in right. the future? It's a good question. And he's, again, he's opening the door, almost like what Cowboy did for Darren Till back in Gdansk. He's opening the door for a young prospect to make a name off one of the veterans of the game. Now, Brian Ortega's on the rise, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. And a title shot is in his future, without a doubt. But getting the win over Frankie Edgar puts him right up there in the top of that conversation. Oh, yeah. And unfortunately for Frankie, if he doesn't win, it drops him right down to the bottom of the pecking order. It, it's, it's an unfortunate situation if Frankie doesn't win because I think we all want to see him get that title shot against Max Holloway. But at the same time, I mean, what an opportunity for Brian Ortega to come in here and, and upset the apple cart. And being an unbeaten fighter as well, you don't have that fear of losing. So you're going to go and try and get the finish, which changes his approach. Another thing that I've liked from Frankie recently are three-round fights. Mm. Because of the pace that he can put on people, he's cranked it up a notch even more. Yep. And I fear that if Ortega lets him get the better of him in the first round, he's, he's swimming up the stream fast and yes. hard. Exactly where Yair Rodriguez found himself, you know, up against the fence in the first round, taking big elbows. We saw that big swelling on his cheekbone, which ultimately was the cause of the, the fight ending at the end of the second round. But Frankie starts fast. He, he does good work early and he puts money in the bank. Yeah. So even if Brian Ortega comes on strong in the third round, not only is he probably down on the scorecards for two rounds, but he's also probably taken a lot of damage from the top position, which is really what Frankie's game is all about. Wear them down and beat them up. Uh, Brian Ortega, when he first starts out, like I said, he's quite cautious. He's very defensive. He reads his opponent. He allows them to shoot a couple of takedowns so he can, he can look for those setups, very much like Verdum did against uh, Cain Velasquez when he took the, the, the title off him. He waits and he looks and he reads. It's the, it's the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu mentality. Use fatigue as a weapon drag them into deeper waters. And because he knows he's a strong finisher in the third round as well, he's more than willing to take that gamble. Four finishes in the third round. Amazing. The third round is one to keep one's eye on. Absolutely. Isn't it? <laughs> um, just a last point on Ortega then. Been with Henna Gracie since he was 13. Yes. And I think his boxing coach followed a couple of these, uh, years later. Mm -hmm. Been with the same crew for so long. How important is that coming into a huge fight like this against Frankie Edgar? It's massive because the, the, the unknown of a, of a big fight like this, the, the added pressure, knowing that there's you know, potentially a title shot on the line, if there's been uncertainty and unrest in your training camp in the build-up to these fights, then you don't have that same kind of confidence, whereas he's been with the same camp all the way through his professional yeah. career. So he's, he's an unbeaten fighter with that same team. So, again, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Exactly. It's not broken. Henna Gracie is one of the best minds when it comes to uh, grappling for mixed martial arts. And he's got a real prospect here that's not only got a swagger and a confidence, he's got the skills to back it up, and he can punch as well, yeah. you know? And we talk about third round finishes. It's not like it's just submissions in the third round, you know? The, the Clay Guida fight, he was down Me. two rounds, yeah. really. I mean, right. he'd, he'd lost those first two rounds. And he went back to his corner, and Henna Gracie said, it's time to turn it on now. It's time to go and take it off him. And he did exactly that. And you've got to think, you know, if Frankie works hard for 10 minutes, starts to slow down a little bit, and leaves that window of opportunity for Ortega, he's the kind of guy that can exploit it to, exploit it to great effect. It's great to have another man in this conversation as it well is. for the featherweight title. It's a really exciting fight. Two massive fights at the top of the card for UFC 222. That wraps us here. Thank you very much for watching. We hope you enjoy the fights. Keep the conversation going using the hashtag InsideTheOctagon.